I'm going to present my work, Representation Learning for Music Classification and Retrieval. And the subtitle is Bridging the Gap Between Natural Language and Music Semantics. My supervisors are Xavier Serra from MTG and Oracle Yosajiun from Talon. Committee members are Juhan Nam from KAIS, Sebastian Ewert from Spotify, and Ishan Yang from Academia Sinica. Thank you for being the committee members. This research is funded by Excelentia Maria de Maestro program. This dissertation comprises six chapters. The first chapter motivates this dissertation research. Then the following chapter reviews relevant concepts and related previous works. From the third to the fifth chapters, I introduce novel approaches to tackle music representation learning in three different aspects, which are model architecture design, training schema, and multimodality. Finally, chapter six concludes the dissertation and discusses future works. This presentation also follows the same order of the thesis, but related works will be introduced in each chapter to provide better context. So there are five chapters in total for today's presentation. Now, let me introduce the slide design for better understanding. On the top left corner, there is a title for the given slide, and sometimes it comes with a subtitle. On the bottom left corner, there is a name of the chapter. And again, there are five chapters in total for today's presentation. On the bottom right corner, there is a slide number so that you can check the progress. And for more intuitive visualization, there's a progress bar. Most of my research is based on solid previous works. So many reference research will appear in today's presentation. Right above the progress bar, there's a reference. And finally, to alleviate confusion and to highlight my original contribution, I have this emoji on the top right corner whose hand is raised. Uh, when this emoji appears, that means the content in the slide is my original contribution. Then let me start from the first chapter. The explosion of digital music has dramatically changed our music consumption behavior. Massive digital music libraries are now available online. When we want to browse or discover music from this huge library, it is nearly impossible to go through the entire catalog exhaustively. As a result, we need robust knowledge management systems more than ever. With the support of various knowledge management systems, we can search music with text inputs and browse the library with the provided curation. And we can check the recommended items or retrieve music based on similarity. These knowledge management systems can be powered by human labeling process, such as well-known music genome project. Music experts can label relevant musical attributes in advance, then each semantic applications can simply utilize the existing labels. However, manual music labeling process is not scalable since it requires strong domain knowledge and also due to its time-consuming nature. Therefore, it would be beneficial if we can support or fully replace the human efforts with algorithms. At the core of these knowledge management systems, there is music representation learning. Then what is representation learning? Yoshua Benjo defined representation learning as rep learning representations of the data that make it easier to extract useful information when building classifiers or other predictors. Let's check a genre classifier example. We want to design a model that predicts musical genre of the given audio. And as shown in the figure, when we design classifiers or predictors, there is a feature extractor block. Researchers manually design features or representations with their domain knowledge and ingenious ideas. The feature extractor block is followed by a classifier or predictor that makes the final decision using the statistic distribution of the extracted representations. For example, Handmade features such as MFCC or zero crossing rate have been widely used in audio classification tasks, followed by classifiers such as support vector machine or k nearest neighbor algorithms. The classification performance was heavily dependent on the choice of manual feature engineering. In contrast, in modern machine learning approaches, especially in deep learning, the model itself directly learns useful features or representations from data. Very minimum pre-processing or none of the pre-processing is required for this end-to-end -end process. Hence, one key to success in modern deep learning is how to design a model to learn good representations. To answer the question, this dissertation tackles the music representation learning in three aspects. 
that are architecture design, scalability, and multimodality. Each of which is chapter three, four, and five of the thesis respectively. In each chapter, we want to answer the following questions. Firstly, what is the best architecture design for music representation learning? Then, how can we scale up our representation models by incorporating large-scale data? Finally, how can we reduce the semantic gap between natural language and music audio so that we can retrieve music with human natural language? This figure shows the overview of the thesis, and this overview will appear at the beginning of each chapter. First, we explore the state-of-the-art architectures for music representation learning and propose novel approaches to tackle the current limitations. Then we review various training schemas, including transfer learning, semi-supervised learning, and self-supervised learning approaches to incorporate large-scale data. Finally, we introduce up-to-date natural language processing approaches to music representation learning so that our model can generalize beyond fixed vocabulary and also enable natural language text inputs for music retrieval. Before moving on to the next chapter, let me highlight the goal of the dissertation again. We improve music representation learning models to enhance music classification and retrieval performance so that it can assist music listeners' knowledge management. Especially, we aim at reducing the semantic gap between natural language and music audio by introducing recent natural language processing techniques to music representation learning research. So this is the title of the thesis, Representation Learning for Music Classification and Retrieval, Bridging the Gap Between Natural Language and Music Semantics. Now, this chapter is about music representation learning models. In this chapter, we will go through state-of-the-art models and propose new novel approaches for music representation learning. The research question in this chapter is very straightforward. What is the best architecture design for music representation learning? When I started this research, deep learning has just started influencing MIR research, and most of them are from computer vision, such as AlexNet or VGGNet. However, since music audio is different from images, MIR researchers started proposing their own architecture designs. However, there are several issues in current music representation learning research. The first issue is related to model assessment. Although there are many music representation models, it is difficult to know which architecture design is the best choice because of inconsistent experimental setups in each paper. Different authors use different data sets for different data splits, and they use different evaluation metrics. Also, pre-processing parameters such as sampling rate or short time period transform parameters are inconsistent. And they use different optimization techniques, which can be sometimes more critical than the architecture design. Also, different hardware and deep learning libraries made it difficult to perform fair comparison. Another limitation of existing music representation learning research is instance level training. Most previous works in music classification research, they take a very short audio excerpt from the music sequence to train their model. In this figure, only three second audio excerpt is input to the model for training. One motivation behind this is simply, we can get more training examples by taking short audio excerpts. And the task gets more difficult because the machine needs to predict with short audio inputs, hence the model will become more robust. And also we do not need to worry about the size of the receptive field because input length will be always the same. After training, the instance level predictions are aggregated in the evaluation phase. And this aggregation is performed using global average pooling, global max pooling, or sometimes adaptive pooling methods. This means music representation models behave as a bag of feature model instead of modeling the entire sequence. This is different from how we perceive music uh, when the order of the sequence is randomly mixed, for example, human will perceive it differently while it's identical for the instance level models. The third issue is less interpretability. Deep learning models are sometimes described as a black box model since it is difficult to understand the decision mechanism behind it. Previous works try to visualize and oralize the activations in the embedding space but they are yet less interpretable since they only highlight spectrotemporal patches. To better understand and improve deep representation models, we need better interpretability. As a solution, firstly, we perform holistic evaluation of the state-of-the-art music representation models. 
then we propose new models that can handle long sequences with better interpretability. There are many different MR tests and data sets for music classification. Among them, in this chapter, we use music tagging as a proxy of music representation learning. There are two main reasons for this. Firstly, scalability. Scalability matters in deep learning, of, in learning research, but large scale data is very rare in MIR research because of license issues. And also music data labeling requires domain expertise and the process is time consuming. However, music taking data sets are larger than other MIR data sets. Some, some data sets take advantage of creative common licenses or they crawl pre-listened audio from the web. Also, they detour labeling issues by taking advantage of user-generated tags. As a result, the million song data set, for example, that includes more than 200,000 uh, labeled songs in it. And the second reason is its versatility. Since music tag covers genre, mood, uh, theme, instrument, language, decade, and so on, the learned representation can solve a variety of music classification problems. To this end, the following experiments in this chapter are tackling music tagging problems as a proxy of tackling music representation learning. We use three different data sets. Magna Tegertin data set includes about 26,000 audio inserts, and tag labels are collected through a game interface where annotators need to put correct music tags for the audio insert. It is widely used for prototyping music tagging models because its size is single GPU friendly. Most previous works use top, uh, top 50 most frequent tags for their experiments. And the main reason is because of the data skewness. Since certain tags appear more frequently in the data set, if we incorporate all existing tags, the main challenge will become solving the skewness of the data instead of solving the classification problem. So following previous works, we use the top 50 tags. The million song data set is widely used for scale level music tagging. It includes 242,000 tracks, and the tags are collected from Last.fm users. Although the tags are noisy due to its data collection nature, it is a good benchmark for scalable music tagging research after post-processing. And here, we also use the top 50 music tags. Finally, the MTG Jamendo dataset is included. Yes, the contribution emoji appeared for the first time. We built this dataset, which comprises 56,000 audio. Different from previous two datasets, it includes full-length audio because it is under Creative Commons license. Also, we provide hierarchical tags that are genre, instruments, and mood theme. But to have continuity from other previous works, we use top 50 tags in this research as well. The tags are proposed by the unloaders of each track, then the tags are manually cleaned afterwards. Two common evaluation metrics for uh, multi-label classification are used. One is the area under receiver operating characteristic curve, which considers threshold varying classification performance. And another is area under the precision recall curve. Most music tagging data sets are unbalanced. And for example, they are more rock music than house music uh, in the data set. Then precision recall area under the precision recall curve penalizes the metric when the model shows low performance for less representative tags. To this end, we included the PRAUC to consider the data unbalance. Now let's review various music tagging models used in this work. The fully convolutional network is one of the early deep learning approaches for music tagging, which comprises four convolutional layers. We can treat mouse spectrograms as if they are images, since they are two-dimensional, then input them to a well-known convolutional neural network with three by three convolution filters to perform music classification. One characteristic of fully convolutional network is a usage of very spar sparse tries in mass pooling layers. As fully convolutional network was originally designed to represent 30 seconds of audio, the model increases the size of the receptive field by uh, increasing the striding sparsity. In contrast, when we crop the input audio into smaller pieces, as we reviewed before, uh, this instance level training uh, will bring some performance gain because we'll get more training examples and test gets more difficult. Yeah. So in many research, this convolution neural network with three by three filters are widely used for instance level training. Sometimes researchers refer to it as VGG model, named after a successful model from computer vision, or 
we just coined the term Shurchan CNN to explicitly disclose it is trained with Shurchan's of audio. We included this Shurchan CNN because it is very widely used, and but there is no reported work in music tagging. The convolutional modules of the harmonic CNN are identical to Shurchan CNN, but it uses slightly different inputs. Harmonic CNN takes advantage of trainable bandpass filters and harmonically stacked time frequency representation inputs. In contrast with fixed mel filter bands, trainable filters bring more flexibility to the model. And as shown in the figure, harmonically stacked representation preserves spectral temporal locality while keeping the harmonic structures uh, through the channel of its input. Let's take a closer look at the harmonic tensor. For a better understanding, I flattened the harmonic tensor. And uh, let's say this frequency beam in the uh, first harmonic, it captures 200 hertz frequency. Uh, in the same frequency beam of the harmonic tensor, uh, in the second harmonic tensor, it captures 400 hertz. And for the third harmonic tensor, it will capture 600 hertz. So in the end, from the same frequency beam, it will capture first, second, third, and fourth harmonics through the channel. So the main difference from short chunk CNN is that the first convolution layer has multiple channels, which is the number of harmonics in the input representation. The harmonic CNN has shown improvements in keyword spotting, acoustic event detection, and music classification. And uh, especially this is beneficial when only limited amount of data are available. Due to limited amount of time, today I only introduce the harmonic CNN as one of the music tagging models. Instead of using three by three filters, the authors of Musician, yeah, it's written in Music CNN, but the authors wanted to pronounce it as Musician. So they proposed to use manually designed filter shapes for music tagging. Vertically long filters are designed to capture timbre characteristics that are relevant to instruments, while horizontally long filters are designed to capture temporal energy flux that is related to rhythmic patterns or tempo. To enforce the pitch invariancy, the following max pulling layer pulls the maximum values across the frequency axis. And finally, the sequence of extracted timbral and temporal features are summarized in one dimensional convolutional layer. Musician is also trained with instance level training. Compared to the two previous works, the sample level CNN was very opposite direction of research. In harmonic CNN or musician, the authors tried to take advantage of our domain knowledge, such as harmonic characteristics in timber identification. In sample level CNN, it gets rid of all pre-processing steps and tackle the music classification task in a fully end-to-end -end data driven fashion. One by three one dimensional convolutional filters are stacked to represent music audio and the strided convolution is used to increase the size of the receptive field. As it does not have any pre-processing step, the model is deeper instead. Sample level CNN and its variants are also trained in an instance level. So here is the result. Interestingly, short chunk CNN, which does not incorporate any domain knowledge, reported consistently high performance in music tagging. That means convolutional neural network from computer vision simply generalizes well for null spectrogram inputs. And instance level training is the key to success. Harmonic CNN showed almost on par to the short term CNN. And in case of musician, it shows good performance in relatively small data set. However, assumption free sample level CNN outperforms the musician as the size of the data set increases. So, this is the summary of our holistic e evaluation. Domain knowledge in model design, such as harmonic front end or vertically horizontally long filters, can be beneficial for small data sets. And assumption-free data-driven approaches perform better with scalable data, but using null spectrogram is yet beneficial for the current available size of the data. Finally, instance-level training shows better performance. Different from previously introduced instance-level training models, the convolutional recurrent neural network is designed to represent music as a long sequence of multiple instances. The convolutional recurrent neural network can be described as a combination of CNN and RNN. The CNN front end captures local acoustic characteristics, and the RNN back end uh, summarizes the sequence of the instance level features. However, its performance is not comparable to instance level CNN models. 
So we present a new approach, which uses transformer backend instead of RNN backend. The music tagging transformer consists of convolutional neural network frontend and transformer backend. The transformer is originally introduced in natural language processing research to model long-term context. And there are multiple reasons to introduce this successful model to music representation learning. Firstly, it is known to handle long sequence without gradient vanishing, which is one drawback of recurrent neural network. And simply, transformer is powerful, not only in natural language processing research. Recently, it has shown its versatility in computer vision, which is not sequential data. And convolution neural network is known to have strong texture bias, which can be interpreted as timber bias in music data. And it is sometimes useful, but uh, music information is not only about timber. So we would like to avoid the timber bias by adopting the transformer backend. Finally, transformer is interpretable because it is a stack of self-attention layers. To understand the brief concept of transformer, I will introduce self-attention mechanism. What self-attention does, uh, self does is to learn the context. Let's check these two sentences. She broke all the records at the Olympics and she broke all the records at the record store. The meaning of the word records are totally different in two sentences. One is a great thing, while another is tragedy. How do we know they mean different things in the two sentences? Is the context. Let's check it with a simpler example. I play bass. In this sentence, bass can be a fish, but it also means an instrument. In this sentence, we know it's an instrument because of the context made by another word, play. In self-attention, each word will be represented as embedding vectors. The word base will be projected to another space, uh, which is a query space. And this is the query embedding of the base. And now we need to know the relationship between the query and other keywords. So we map each word into key space using another projection layer, phi. Then the query vector and different key vectors are multiplied to form attention scores. The scores are the relationship between base and I, base and play, and base and base, respectively. Through the training process, relevant words will get higher attention scores. In this example, the attention score between base and base will be the highest, highest because it's itself. And then the next will be the score between base and play. Finally, each word will be projected to the value space. Then the values are multiplied with the attention scores. As more relevant words have higher attention scores, more relevant words values will contribute to form the higher level semantics. By stacking the multiple self-attention layers, the deeper layer can include more context with the high level semantics of the sequence. So in music tagging transformer, we replace the word embedding with audio embeddings. Short audio excerpts pass through the shallow convolution neural network. Then each time step embedding performs similar to the token level word embedding. Each audio chunk is only 0.1 seconds in our experiment. That means uh, with a single chunk, it cannot be semantically meaningful. So the transformer backend needs to model the sequence of the short audio instances to represent music. As a result, the proposed model outperforms the previous state-of-the-art music tagging models using the Millenson dataset. And of course, the model can be further improved with strong data augmentation. Another benefit of using transformer is long sequence modeling. Uh, as it does not suffer from vanishing gradient, we can perform song level predictions by increasing the size of the receptive field. As shown with the blue curve, the transformer preserves the performance with long input sequence, while instance level training with green curve, it goes lower as input becomes longer. There's a small performance drop with 30 seconds of audio with the transformer, but we suspect this came from less amount of training examples as we cannot expect the effect of random cropping augmentation. One more benefit of using transformer is better interpretability. We have an example of concatenated uh, audio of female voice and male voice. Uh, then we visualize uh, which part of the audio contributed more to predict a certain tag. As you can see from the heat map, the transformer successfully pays attention to more relevant parts for each tag. 
So here's the conclusion. Music tagging transformer claims the new state of the art in music tagging. The proposed model can handle long sequence of music and it is more <coughs> interpretable. Another benefit that was not introduced here is that the transformer can also return token level uh, predictions. Uh, instead of returning one prediction for the sequence, it can return predictions at each time step, which makes uh, this architecture suitable for bit tracking or music transcription research. These are the list of published works from this chapter. I would like to highlight that the first paper, although it was not published on conference paper, uh, it is the first approach to introduce transformer in music representation learning research. And the second paper about the holistic evaluation uh, helped following researchers in music tagging and also provided an open source implementation of all the existing models. The third paper introduced data-driven harmony filters that are useful when we have relatively small data sets. And finally, the fourth paper firmly established a new state of the art in music tagging. Let's move on to the next topic, representation learning at scale. In previous chapter, we reviewed various architecture design choices. In this chapter, we go through various training schemas to scale up our representation models. Research question of this chapter is, how can we incorporate large scale data for music representation learning? Deep learning models are data hungry. In general, um, in general, with more data, the performance gets better. As a result, human agents need to label more data to have a better performing model. And this is quite ironic because we started music classification research to save human efforts of manual labeling. But now we need to label more data to facilitate the automatic music classification. There are several solutions to overcome the limited amount of data, such as transfer learning, semi-supervised learning, and self-supervised learning. Detailed previous works are introduced in the dissertation. And in this presentation, I'll mainly highlight our contribution in music classification research using these approaches. The core idea of transfer learning is to learn knowledge from solving a problem, which is source test, then apply the learned knowledge to solve other relevant problems, which are target tests. This is useful when we do not have enough label data for the target test, but have a large scale label data that is relevant to the target test. For example, when we do not have enough label data for genre classification, we can train a music tagging model with the million song data set as a source test. Then we transfer the learned model parameters and fine tune them with the target genre classification test so that we can make the model more robust. However, this process relies on other labeling process yet. Instead of that, we can also utilize other source of informa information to design the source test. Uh, for artist names, we don't need any extra labeling process because normally they come with metadata. And each artist has own musical characteristics. That means we can train an artist classification model as a source test model, then transfer the model to solve other downstream tests. However, there are myriads of artist names and there are uh, not many songs per each artist, which makes categorical classification unrealistic. We further elaborate this idea by designing the target features to be vectors. Firstly, we cluster the low level features and represent artists with the bevel features. Then we process topping modeling to represent each artist with the artist group vector. Finally, we train a regression model that targets the artist group vector. And with this approach, we could win the music genre classification challenge at the web conference 2018. Now let's check semi-supervised learning. In a realistic scenario, we have few labeled data and abundant unlabeled data. For example, in the million song data set, although it includes 1 million tracks in it, only 24% of them are labeled with at least one of the top 50 tags. That means only 24% of the data are used in a supervised learning, while 76% of unlabeled data, they are discarded. Semi-supervised learning incorporates both labeled and unlabeled data together. In semi-supervised learning, we want to minimize both supervised and unsupervised losses, where their ratio is parameterized using a hyperparameter lambda. And let's check how can we define different unsupervised losses. Self-training, also known as teacher-student training, is a semi-supervised approach that consists of a few steps. Firstly, we train a teacher model with labeled data, and this process is identical to the supervised learning. Then with the teacher trained teacher model, 
we want the model to make predictions using unlabeled data that we have. As a result, although we do not have ex uh, exact labels for the unlabeled data, we can have pseudo labels, which are teacher models prediction. Finally, we train a student model to optimize the pseudo labels. The student model has two losses. One is a supervised loss using labeled data, and another one is an unsupervised loss using unlabeled data, but with generated pseudo labels. And consistency training is another way of designing unsupervised loss. It constrains models to generate noise invariant predictions. From a, from a single item, we apply data augmentation. And this data augmentation is stochastic data augmentation. So the outputs from each branch will be different. Then the augmented inputs are uh, input to the model. Uh, and we expect the predictions to be consistent. For example, uh, even after we apply white noise, pitch shift, or delay, we still know the song is identical to the original one. Consistency training regularizes the model to be robust against the noise. This idea is actively used in self-supervised learning, especially contrasted learning such as Sinclair. Finally, entropy regularization minimizes the entropy of the model's prediction. In other words, we want the model's predictions of unlabeled data to be confident and sharp. This can be performed by explicitly minimizing the entropy of the predictions, or this can be done by targeting one of encoded pseudo labels. By picking up a class with maximum probability, we can generate a pseudo label as shown in the uh, most, most right side of the figure. Then we use the pseudo label as a ground truth for the unlabeled data. Of course, we can incorporate all of these approaches of designing unsupervised losses. Previous works such as mixed match or noisy student training are the examples. Among them, we use noisy student training for music tagging. <laughs> the basic concept of noisy student training is self-training. We first train a teacher model with labeled data. Then the teacher model makes predictions using unlabeled data. And as a result, we have the pseudo labels. Finally, the model needs to be optimized by targeting the pseudo labels. So far, it's identical to other self-training approaches. But to inject noise invariant constraint, uh, there is a strong data augmentation in the student model. So this is the overview of noisy student training. The orange line is a supervised learning pipeline with labeled data, and the blue line is a self-training pipeline. The student model needs to generate predictions that are identical to the teacher model's predictions, even after strong data augmentation. When we generate pseudo labels, uh, they can be one half encoded hard labels or soft labels as shown in the figure. And the original paper reported that both hard and soft label work, but soft labels work slightly better for out of domain unlabeled data. In noisy student training, one can design the student model to be bigger than the teacher model. As a student model can take advantage of more data with more parameters, we can interpret the process to be knowledge expansion. On the other hand, we can also design the student model to be smaller than the teacher model. In this case, student model is trained to mimic or outperform the teacher model with fewer parameters. This process is knowledge distillation. And the distilled model is beneficial for applications with less computing power because it is more compact. In our music tagging transformer work, we also explored noisy student training for music classification. Firstly, we used short chunk ResNet and transformer trained with supervised learning as our baseline. That means these two models only utilize the 24% of the millions on data set. Uh, there is a performance gain with the data augmentation, such as polarity inversion, pitch shifting, and high pass and low pass filtering. Then the performance is further improved using the noisy student training. This is the knowledge expansion process since we could incorporate both labeled and unlabeled data of the Nielsen data set. Finally, we also experimented knowledge distillation approach. And interestingly, this model outperformed the knowledge expansion approach with fewer number of parameters. We suspect this is because our unlabeled data set is only three times bigger than the supervised one. So the student model does not fully utilize the model capacity. So we need to verify this with much larger unlabeled data set to confirm the hypothesis. Here's the conclusion of this chapter. Transfer learning enables more robust representation when sufficient source test data is provided. 
And the noisy stream training successfully improves the music tagging performance by taking advantage of large scale unlabeled data. Finally, knowledge distillation also achieves better performance than supervised learning, only with fewer parameters. These are the published works from this chapter. With the transfer learning approaches, we could win the music genre classification challenge. And the noisy uh, student training for music pegging was introduced in our music pegging transformer paper. Next chapter is about multimodal representation learning. Research question in this chapter is how to reduce the semantic gap between natural language and music audio. In previous chapters, we enhanced music classification using various architecture designs and training schemas and proposed models could capture music audio semantics that are useful for classification and retrieval. However, is the machine learned representation flexible enough? For example, this machine can classify music genres and instruments. After the training, the machine can retrieve suitable music for the given query correctly. In this example, rhythm and blues. However, it cannot generalize when it is queried with unseen tags, although RMB is the acronym of the rhythm and blues. Like this, machine learned music audio representation is yet far from our natural language semantics. We define this gap between machine learned audio representation and natural language as a semantic gap, and we aim at reducing the gap by taking advantage of up-to-date natural language processing techniques and data. In this chapter, we tackle two challenges. Firstly, the current music classification and retrieval models cannot generalize beyond fixed vocabulary. It cannot handle unseen tags, although the tags are synonyms or acronyms of the existing tag taxonomy. Secondly, the current music representation models are limited to tag label representation. We want the model to be more flexible so that it can handle natural language inputs. As solution, we firstly explore multimodal metric learning using pre-trained word embedding so that the model allows flexible vocabulary. Then we expand the idea using pre-trained language models to allow natural language inputs for music retrieval. Let's check the tag-based retrieval approach first. In multimodal metric learning, we aim at reaching two different modalities by optimizing a shared multimodal embedding space. In the embedding space, we want relevant items to be closer and irrelevant items to be far apart. So it'll look like this after we optimize the embedding space. The tag disco is mapped uh, closely with a song with the tag disco, while another song without disco tag to be far apart. This figure illustrates the overview of our proposed approach. From a given anchor tag Y, uh, the model maps the positive song XP to be closer than the negative song XN in the multimodal embedding space. To represent songs, we can use music representation models that we explored before. We use the short chunk CNN for the simplicity. And also another type of music representation has been tested, which is not from audio. Uh, from a huge user item interaction metrics, we can derive a latent representation for music. And this embedding includes more cultural context in it. So we introduced uh, two different ways of representing music. One is using music audio, and another is using user consumption data. For the tag embedding, one can use simply one hot encoded vectors, but we take advantage of pre-trained word embedding so that the network can utilize the word semantics better. In pre-trained word embedding spaces, such as word to back or globe, relevant words are closely distributed in the latent space. For example, there is a cluster of the names of the cities and their office furniture on the most right side and family related terms in the middle. Like this, by taking advantage of pre-trained word embeddings, we can expect the model to handle beyond fixed vocabulary. For example, there is an unseen tag, new disco. It is not in our training tag taxonomy, but new disco is semantically similar to disco in the pre-trained word embedding space. As a result, it will be mapped closely to disco in the multimodal embedding space. In the paper, we introduced many different techniques to improve the retrieval performance. Among them, I would like to highlight one contribution. The original word to back is pre-trained with Google News. As a result, it includes less musical context in it. For example, in general, a word jungle means uh, land covered with dense forest. However, in music, musical context, jungle is a music genre that is originated in the UK. 
Also, the word house is a building that we are living in, while in musical context, it's a type of electronic music from Chicago with four on the floor beats. So we trained our own musical word embedding using music-related texts, such as album reviews, music biographies, and Wikipedia. In this table, we visualize the nearest words from a given tag. For example, nearest words of jungle in the word to back space, there are jungles, rainforests, Amazon jungles, swamps. On the other hand, our domain specific word embedding maps breakbeat, dub, drum and bass, and rhyme as its neighbor. Also for house, there are bungalow, apartment, bedroom, and townhouse near the given word in the word, word to back space. But in our proposed word embedding space, deep house, club, rave, parties, and Ibiza are closely mapped. Like this, our proposed word embedding includes more musical context in it. Previously, we introduced two different approaches to represent music. One is using audio embeddings, and another is using user item interaction data. As shown in the table, audio-based approaches reported better retrieval performance. However, when we use industry-scale user item interaction data, it outperforms audio-based approaches, which means the user item interaction data is powerful enough when it includes large-scale user history. So this is the conclusion of the tag-based music retrieval research. Firstly, Multimodal metric learning enables tag-based music retrieval, and the pre-trained word embedding helps model to generalize beyond fixed vocabulary. Domain-specific word embedding provides more musical context in it. Finally, user item interaction data is powerful at industry scale, which surpasses the audio-based approach. However, um, this result can be changed if we have more training data for audio. Now let's step up from the word level representation. Uh, from the tag-based music retrieval approach, uh, if you replace the tag branch with up-to-date natural language processing models, we can expect the model to work with natural language inputs. So we extend this multimodal metric learning approach in sentence level or paragraph level. Uh, the main motivation of this research is to assist content creators to browse music more efficiently. The proposed model matches suitable music for the given content, especially we focus on the audiobook use case. For a given story in a text format, appropriate music will be retrieved. The first challenge is the lack of data. In most cross-modal retrieval or multimodal retrieval research, there are paired data sets. For example, um, in our tag-based music retrieval research, we could pair tags with audio. However, we do not have such paired data of music and stories in public use. Instead, in this work, we focus on mood or emotion, which plays an important role in the text to music matching process. In this work, following previous work, we use the term emotion and mood interchangeably. If we have a mood and emotion tags, we can pair them together. We can match happy text with happy music. Also, we can match um, text and music with sad mood. However, here arises another problem which is mismatched vocabulary of different mood taxonomies. In this example, they use different term anger and angry or fearful and scary. To match them together, we still need a manual process of matching different vocabularies. Furthermore, for some moods, in this case, surprise text, do not have any counterpart mood in music taxonomy. We introduced multiple solutions for tackling this mismatched vocabulary and the proposed approaches can be grouped into three categories, which are classification, regression, and metric learning. All the proposed approaches are using the same text representation model and the same music representation model. For music representation, uh, we use the short chunk CNN again for the simplicity. For the text encoder, we consider a variant of the BERT. BERT is a successful language model that is based on the transformer encoder. And this BERT is a compact version of BERT, which can be obtained by knowledge distillation. As BERT has demonstrated its suitability in text emotion recognition, we use it as our text representation model. As a result, we have a text branch with BERT and a music branch with Church on CNN. Today, I'll introduce two best performed approaches among six. Uh, one is a valence arousal regression method. According to many previous words in mood classification and emotion recognition, it is known that the regression of valence and arousal is beneficial for predicting mood and emotion. If you map the emotion tags into this predefined valence and arousal space using, um, using the lexicon, 
uh, we can formalize the problem as a regression test. In this approach, two separate models are trained to optimize each item's position in this two-dimensional valence and arousal space. After training the separate models, we can map all items into the valence and arousal space. For example, anger texts are on the upper left corner uh, using the text data, and angry music are on the upper left corner as well. As they are closely mapped in the space, we can match them together, although they are different words, anger and angry. However, the mapping process of tag to balance around the space requires human efforts. Also, there's a possibility that we do not have their matching in the predefined lexicon. So here we introduce a multimodal metric learning approach. Metric learning is trained to minimize the triple loss, and we want the distance between relevant items to be closer than the distance between irrelevant items. In this example, we want the distance between happy text and happy song in the embedding space to be closer than the distance between happy text and sad music. As metric learning is known for compo composing more granular similarities, it is widely used in many retrieval tasks. In this process, when we do not have the matched positive pair, we regarded the nearest item in the pre-trained word to back space to be a positive pair. In this example, happy music is the positive item for joy text. As shown in this figure, each modality is mapped to the shared space, and the shared space is optimized to minimize the triplet loss. As this model consists of two branches, uh, one for text and one for music, we call it a two-branch metric learning model. In this metric learning process, the model can learn the relationship between happy text and happy music, or surprise text and exciting music. But the relationship within the modality will be ignored in the embedding space, as we do not give any supervision of relationship between anger text and happy text, for example. So we try to preserve the neighborhood structure within modalities by adding one more branch, which is tag embedding branch. As a result, there are three triple losses, which are tag to text and tag to music and text to music. We visualize learned representation from multimodal metric learning using UMAP. On the left side, it, uh, it only uses the two branches, while on the right side, it's a visualization using the three branches to preserve uh, mood distribution within modality. The three branch metric learning model on the right side shows better continuity than the two branch model on the left by preserving the neighborhood structure. The yellow colored exciting music, for example, is continuously mapped in the three branch metric learning space, while they are entangled with happy music in two branch metric learning space. Also, pink colored tender music is continuously mapped between sad and happy music in three branch metric learning space, while they are entangled with sad music in two branch metric learning space. Actually, these preserved continuity within modality can be found in manually designed valence and arousal space, which justifies the suitability of the proposed three branch metric learning model for a text to music retrieval as data driven embeddings. Uh, let's try one demo from the three branch metric learning model. From the given story, the proposed model recommended uh, this music. Uh, by the way, the voice has been recorded separately, so it's not a part of the algorithm. Peter was most dreadfully frightened. He rushed all over the garden, for he had forgotten the way back to the gate. So here's the conclusion. Uh, manually designed balance in arousal space is a strong baseline. But we can also facilitate text to music retrieval in a data driven fashion using multimodal metric learning. Finally, three branch metric learning enables more continuous embedding space by preserving the neighborhood structure, neighborhood mood structures within modality. From this chapter, two papers have been published. One is tag based music retrieval using word embeddings and another is emotion embedding spaces for matching music to stories. The second paper received the best student paper award at previous year. This is the last chapter of today's presentation. I summarize reusable insights of this dissertation as follows. Although the inclusion of domain knowledge in architecture design is beneficial in small data set, assumption-free data-driven approaches outperform when a large-scale data is available. 
and convolution a neural network front end with the transformer backend from the established the new state of the art in music tagging. And this architecture is temporally more interpretable than previous approaches. Transfer learning and noisy student training approaches successfully improve the music classification performance by taking advantage of large scale source task data or large scale unlabeled data. Multimodal embedding spaces enable tag to music retrieval beyond fixed vocabulary, and especially musically fine tuned domain specific embedding provides more context. And user item interaction data is extremely powerful when it comes in industry scale. Finally, Multimodal embedding spaces enable text to music matching, and manually designed balance and arousal space is a strong baseline, but we can also achieve comparable results using fully data driven approaches. There are some limitations in the proposed research. First of all, we use music tagging as a proxy of music representation learning. The main, main intuition behind this is because of the availability of scalable data and the versatility of music tags. However, tag-based information cannot cover the entire music semantics or music information. For example, the data set we use do not have any information about music per keys or tempo. Another limitation is the bias in models. Most experimented models are using convolution neural network, which is known to be strongly biased towards texture. The texture is often interpreted as timber of music, and that means timber transformation or other adversity intent can lead the model to make totally different predictions. Data augmentation can elevate this issue, but we cannot assure that the model can generalize well to unseen types of deformation. Finally, data bias. Since our models are data-driven, the model can be biased very easily by the training data. Especially the data set we use in research are biased towards Western popular music. More diverse data set can be considered or debiasing approaches need to be applied. Finally, I want to put two research questions for the future work. First question is, what is good representation? As you reviewed, um, this dissertation used music tagging as a proxy of representation learning. However, recently there became different ways of training scalable model with generic models or self-supervised approaches. Each paper introduces its own way of evaluation in downstream and minor tests, but they're using different ways of evaluation like we already experienced in music tagging research. To this end, I believe more holistic evaluation of music representation learning is required. To do so, we need to define good music representation. And good rep representation is supposed to be robust and generalizable and versatile. Another direction is multimodality. In this dissertation, we explored multimodal approaches to bridge text and music. And our music perception is more multimodal beyond those two. We listen to the audio, lyric adds more modality, and the uh, music harmonizes with cover arts or music video. More versatile multimodal music representation learning will enable more flexible and robust music representation. Finally, I list up the contributions. I organized a tutorial about music classification at Izmir 2021 and archived the material as an online book so that future researchers can follow the guideline. I published four Izmir papers, three ICAS papers, and one SMC paper. Also, I submitted five challenge and workshop papers. I awarded the best event paper at last Izmir, and I won the Jung classification challenge at the web conference 2018. For better reproducibility, all implementation details of my research papers are open source, and I peer reviewed conference papers from Izmir, SMC, InterSpeech, and also multiple journal papers. And every vacation, I try to put the learned knowledge into practice through industrial internships and collaborations. I cannot disclose everything I did at each company, but I'm very happy to see that my research outcomes are helping music listeners experience using real world data. So this is the last slide of today's presentation. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>